William Rears, an informational security lead for Fairfield University. He's a pen tester. He's also the B-Sides Connecticut co-founder, Nested Hackerspace co-founder, former QSA, security engineer, network engineer, systems engineer, and all-around security geek. CISSP Purple Team, William Rear. Thanks very much. So this talk is focused on uh, people who hire pen testing companies or want to hire pen testing companies and people who uh, want to become pen testers and get into offensive security work. So I tried to break this into two different parts. So one part focuses on people who hire pen testing companies and pen testers in general. And then uh, for people who want to get into that line of work, I work now for Fairfield University uh, in a defensive role. Um, I co-founded uh, Security B-Sides Connecticut and Nesset Hackerspace uh, LGBT supporter. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. So, first section for folks that are hiring a pen testing company, uh, I would say one of the questions you want to ask yourself before you even have this conversation of which company I'm I going to hire is, what is a pen test? So I figure we'll just ask the audience, does anyone want to just give that a shot? What a, what a pen test is? And I guess different people have different definitions, but for me, it's basically um, attacker uh, simulation. So it's not something that's directly repeatable. You're basically taking behavior and creating it on the fly given a certain situation or scenario or network. So if um, you have one company and it's pen tested uh, two different ways, then you may get two radically two different results. Uh, both may be breached, but they could end up breached in very different ways. And I want to point this out because there's a common misconception between what a pen tester is uh, and what a pen test is versus what a vulnerability scan is and what a vulnerability audit is. Um, and so uh, part of the hit points that I wanted to take in this talk is if you're conducting a pen test, you don't want to fall into just conducting a vulnerability assessment or a vulnerability scan and submitting that as your pen test. So on paper, it's this very neat, tidy process. Um, you have your, your kickoff, you have your recon, you have your exploitation and exfiltration, and then you have reporting. Um, and on paper, it looks like this very neat process, but in reality, a pen test really isn't going to be that neat and tidy. In reality, it's going to be sort of this jumble of uh, what can I try and get into? Um, that didn't work, let me try this. That didn't work, let me try this. And this is more in line with how an attacker works. This isn't how a vulnerability assessment works. A vulnerability assessment is just purely automation. So uh, the difference between the two is uh, human intelligence and manual testing and basically uh, a person making judgments about what to do next instead of just pure automation. And the other thing I'd say is that a pen test isn't a checklist. So there's lots of guides and frameworks out there for conducting a pen test. So things like the uh, uh, PTES, which was uh, created and co-founded by Dave Kennedy. Um, there's standards for PCI. There's, there's various different standards. And those are guidelines. They're not, they're not a checklist. You wouldn't just go down and check every single one of those boxes and say, OK, I did that. You've got your pen test now. And so I tried to illustrate that a little bit better. So the big difference between a vulnerability assessment and a pen test is that the VA or a vulnerability assessment is going to be metric based. So you can repeat it over and over and over again. And you can see if you're improving. Where you can repeat a pen test over and over again, but it's narrative based. It's not necessarily metric driven. And it uses creativity. And the whole point of this is to figure out, OK, um, given my environment, um, beyond my vulnerability scan, what can an attacker do? What are they going to try? Um, and that should always be updating, and that should always be uh, evolving over time. 
<laughs> so before you even get into a pen test, you probably want to start conducting internal vulnerability and external vulnerability testing first, because that's going to identify a lot of your, your low-hanging fruit. And then you want to answer some basic prerequisite questions. Um, things like, you know, what devices do I have? Who has access to those devices? Uh, how are these devices being patched? And, you know, when did I do a vulnerability scan? And what were the results? And what critical things are open and what still need work? And once you've got to that point, then it's probably time to start thinking about uh, having a pen test done. But there are certain situations where uh, a pen test is useful even if you haven't gotten that far. Uh, particularly if you're trying to get uh, buy-in uh, from upper management and they need to, they're not convinced that there's a need for security or a security buy, a pen test can demonstrate impact. So it can, um, more so than, you know, maybe you may be able to do yourself, uh, nothing says we have a security problem like a screenshot of a CIO's mailbox or a recording of voice conversations or uh, photos of information that shouldn't be public. So once you get that far and you decide that you want to have a pen test done, um, these are great reasons uh, to conduct a test. So you're going to verify what you know is in place and, and what what you have. You can create that political capital that I just talked about. And then you can determine uh, how responsive uh, your organization is to uh, being under attack. And the other thing it helps with is finding things you don't know about. So, so there's this uh, Mike Tyson quote that everyone has a great plan until they get punched in the face. And that is definitely true for a pen test. So you can think you have absolutely everything taken care of, and then uh, a good pen tester comes in, and they creatively evaluate everything you have, and they go about attacking your system in a way that you haven't even considered. And that's a great reason to conduct a pen test, uh, because that's going to find things that you don't know about uh, that go beyond just the scope of um, doing the basics. And so, like I said, um, nothing says that you have a problem like uh, proof that there's been a compromise or that there could have been a compromise. So now comes time for uh, you to choose a firm. And so what should you look for? Um, if it was me choosing to hire a firm, these are some of the things that I would look for. Um, given all the certifications that are out there, OSCP is probably the, the best for demonstrating knowledge of how to conduct a pen test. Uh, I would definitely review a sample of the, the firm's work. Uh, you don't want to see things like just pure tables and pie charts. I mean, infographics are great, but you want to see a narrative of how the tester conducted the test, what they were thinking, and what drove their process to, to get where they to get where, where they got, uh, so to speak. And you want to see photos of evidence, too. Um, you want to be able to prove that you know, they didn't just run a scan, um, that you know, they did some manual testing. And you know, there's definitely uh, automation, uh, and there's definitely uh, a place for automation in pen tests, but that's not the end-all, be-all. And lastly, I would say uh, you want to look for professionalism. Uh, so, you know, there's lots of firms out there that will, um, they, while they might be talented, uh, they don't act in a way that's professional that you would want to have a trustworthy person have access to potentially sensitive and confidential data. So you want to have some assurance that, you know, this company is reputable, that they're going to handle things in a manner that's consistent with your own standards of how you handle or how you want to handle confidential information. Uh, because if they're successful, they're going to, you know, they could potentially walk away with the keys to the kingdom. And so you want to make sure that they protect that information. So I'm going to jump around or 
jump all the way to the end where a pen tester gives you a report. So, and we'll cover the in-between in the second section when we talk about you know, what goes into becoming a pen tester. But, so you go through this process, the tester or the firm conducts the pen test, and now you have this report. So what do you do with this report? Uh, and a lot of companies, unfortunately, they're like, okay, we have our pen test report. We can file that away until next year. Um, but what you should do is make sure you drill and understand everything that's on that report uh, that the, the pen testing company or the, the, the tester found and use that as an opportunity to drive remediation. And then once you've remediated everything, you basically want to schedule a follow-up and verify that everything is the way you think it is. And then periodically, you want to go through a process of repeating the test and seeing if there's uh, a new attack that uh, maybe you haven't considered uh, that would apply to your organization that you know, maybe you don't already know about. So does anyone have any questions about um, hiring a pen testing company or a pen tester? Go ahead. Roughly how much do they cost? It really depends on the scope of uh, the company. Um, a lot of companies will <coughs> sell a pen test by IP address. Um, these are typically, typically companies that are uh, operating primarily based on automation or based on scanners. Um, so depending on the size of your organization, you know, pricing can go from 5,000 to 20,000 to even more depending on exactly what you want. So uh, you could have a test done that's just purely external. So you just have the company um, try and get into X number of devices, uh, X number of applications. Um, it could be internal. Uh, you could have people uh, actually on the ground in prem. Um, there could be social engineering components, so there could be email, or there could be um, physical components. And if you can, the wider the scope of the test, the better off you are overall. Um, and the more, su the more chance of success that the tester is going to have. So um, if you're hiring a company, um, I would go as wide as you possibly can. Um, because that's going to identify uh, the most realistic, uh, the most realistic, uh, what do you call it? The, it's going to be the most realistic emulation of an attack. So the second part is, okay, so what do you want to do to become a tester and what does a test look like? So. First and foremost, uh, you really want to start with ethics. And uh, this is something that uh, many organizations don't talk about or many presentations don't really touch upon. But you're going to be handling information uh, potentially from a company uh, that's you know, near and dear and critical to their business. So you want to do your best to protect that information. And you really don't want to talk about who you're working for or what you found or what your findings are. Um, if you're with a mature organization, they're going to have process and procedure uh, to store this information. Um, if you're with a startup or uh, a fairly new organization, then you need to make sure you take due care with storing, and storing any evidence that you find. And lastly, uh, especially for organizations that fall under PCI, they're required to have a pen test. And so it's very common to have an organization push you uh, to uh, they're basically going to try and push you on uh, whether a finding is critical, what criticality is that. Um, and it's easy to fall into the trap of uh, downgrading a, a finding. Um, and I would strongly encourage you to not do that, uh, to not basically uh, compromise the quality of the report. Because it doesn't really do any good for you as a tester or for the organization. It basically just is one less thing that is off someone's plate that they have to remediate. So some of the things that you can do to get involved in pen testing. Um, here's some, some quick tips for 
uh, getting involved in the security community. So things like planning a, uh, a B-sides or publishing research or hacking things in general. Uh, things like participating in a CTF. These are all really great ideas. Um, they build up your skill and they also connect you with people who do this sort of thing all the time. Um, and lastly, I would say find someone who's a mentor or mentor someone. These are all great things. And, uh, this is relatively new and I, haven't, I don't have a ton of experience myself, but uh, bug bounty programs like HackerOne and BugCrowd um, are uh, becoming very popular ways to uh, both build skill, get involved in testing, and build a reputation for yourself uh, because you're going to have a public profile. And companies like Salesforce actually look at this information and look to see, okay, well, have you participated in a bug bounty program? And if so, what did you find and how did you find it? So these are all really good ways to get started beyond just um, a college education, which is still important, but these things are really important too. That should be better. Test. Test. There we go. And so there's... Um, other existing knowledge that you can have that is helpful to testing. So figure that whatever you're testing, you need to have some expertise on. So if you're running into Linux systems or Windows systems, or you need to automate something, these are things that you need to know ahead of time. So if having things like a solid background in networking, in scripting, in Python or Ruby or C, these are all really good things. Um, and they're going to make you that much more successful. And what I would say also is that if you just jump into pen testing and you don't have a solid background in what you're testing, you can give an organization a false sense of security. So you want to make sure that you know if you're not really comfortable breaking into something or uh, getting into a system or understanding that system, you know maybe you should decline the work. Uh, because it's better to decline it and have someone who is comfortable testing those sorts of systems than have you test it, not find anything, and then give an organization a false sense of security. So you've established your network, you have uh, established these basic skills, and now you want to get into actually conducting a test. So I wanted to talk a bit about what that's like and what the different phases of that are. So depending on the standard of uh, the framework that you're looking at, um, there can be as many as eight different phases of a pen test. Uh, but basically they break down to uh, having a kickoff with the client, to uh, performing some sort of reconnaissance, whether it's social engineering or it's uh, purely IT based uh, or IP address based. Uh, to uh, attacking those systems, exfiltrating the data, and then reporting on that. So there's some, and, and I'll publish these slides after, so these are basically some, some tools that you can look at and familiarize yourself with ahead of time to understand how they might apply to, to a contest. So first and foremost, uh, you're going to have a kickoff with uh, your client. And so they're going to want to know, um, you know what experience you have. So you, you need to be relatively comfortable speaking with, uh, with a client about what you know, what you don't know. And you're going to need to ask them certain questions about what kind of system they have, what their goals for the test are. Um, and one thing that's really important is making sure that they have proof of the IP addresses that you're going to be testing against. Um, early in my career, I was provided a list of IP addresses and the client didn't actually own them, and that ended poorly for me. <laughs> um, so, in things like physical testing, you know, you want to know, do the guards have guns? Uh, are there silent alarms? Um, you know, who's watching the cameras? Are they, you know, on-prem? Are they just recording? Do they have a third-party service? These are all things that you need to know ahead of time. When you're talking about uh, web application testing uh, and you talk about fuzzing web applications, certain forms will automatically send emails. So 
you know, you want to make sure that the entire organization is aware that you're testing. That way, if you start fuzzing some web app and someone gets flooded with, you know, a whole slew of emails, you know, they know who to contact to make that stop. And lastly, I'd say um, combined attack. So an attacker isn't just going to do a port scan uh, and try and exploit a system. They're going to try and combine that. So you know, maybe they send a phishing email. Maybe the phishing email lands on a, uh, a landing page that serves up malware. Maybe the malware uh, provides you a foothold into their internal network. And from there, you know, maybe you want to pick it up. And you want to verify that these attack methods are what they're expecting to see and that they're not expecting just a simple scan. And lastly, um, it's becoming more and more common for organizations to employ uh, third-party vendors and cloud providers. So many of these providers allow you to actually uh, test applications in their cloud, uh, but you need to verify that information first. So, and lastly, you want to set expectations. So things like uh, how often you're going to communicate, um, how often updates are going to be, um, what the report's going to contain, and what level of detail. Uh, one thing that I like to provide when, when I've conducted tests are basically a full forensic log of everything I did, when I did it, what I executed, why I executed, and basically all raw notes. Um, and this isn't unreasonable to ask for. Um, and it shows you know, the thought process that the tester took, and it, it shows how to repeat the test to verify that uh, once remediation has happened, uh, how it's basically how to verify things are actually fixed. So before you start, uh, one of the things that you're going to want to do is figure out all the different tools you're going to be touching and using and setting up uh, the tool in such a way that it creates logs. So if you're using a tool like Metasploit, uh, you can spool that log to you know, a certain destination. If you're uh, using something like Nictu uh, to test a web application, you can pipe the output of the command to uh, you know, some sort of text file. And you can at least have a time and date stamp, aside from just the manual notes that you're keeping. And these are all things that you want to keep. And when you get into testing and you're testing for a company, it's really common to have to stop on one test, pick up on another test, and then come back to the other test you know, weeks later or maybe a month later because something happened and you had to stop. So having all this information, having solid notes with date stamps, and having all the output is really important to be able to pick up and repeat the work and basically understand, OK, where exactly you work. So you've established this and how you're going to log. So you go into your first phase of recon. And so what does that look like? So the goal of recon isn't just to enumerate DNS records or who is information. You basically want to understand what their business is, what they do, what's important to this client. And from that point, you want to drill in deeper and deeper and deeper. So if this is a retailer, um, you can make some some suggestions or some assumptions about what's important. So you know, if they're a retailer, maybe they have credit card transactions. Um, they're probably worried about their reputation. They probably process everything internally because they're processing so many transactions. Uh, depending, it, we'll assume it's a national retailer. So um, you know, maybe you want to start on LinkedIn and find IT resources and figure out who these people are that control these systems. Um, Maybe you want to, uh, you know, go through their profiles, figure out what systems they have in place. You know, if someone says they work for company A and they're familiar and experts in SourceFire, you can probably assume that they have a SourceFire IPS. Um, and taking the information from these folks, um, you can pivot around off that information. So you can take one piece of information about, say, you know, IT worker uh, John Smith, and understanding everything about John Smith uh, to the point where you know, maybe you want to design a social engineering pretext to try and uh, get his information. So understanding um, 
the people in detail as far as how how you want to craft and how you want to get close to them is really important. So uh, aside from just the, the typical, you know, pivoting from DNS records or UIs or SSL or IP block ownership, um, and these are go hand in hand between social and technical. So there are certain tools that help automate this. Um, and you know, for the for the purpose of this presentation, we're going to just assume that you know we're doing an on-prem internal pen test. So here's some of the tools that you might look to um, understand. And I know, so one of the things I used to love to do is uh, it's day one. I'm on a pen test, and the first thing I do is just fire open Wireshark and just listen to what's happening on the network. And just by listening to uh, broadcasts, you can determine okay. Uh, how is routing set up? Uh, are, how tight is the network? Is there 802.1x? Is there, um, what's being broadcast? Is there HSRP? Um, and you can make fairly good determinations about how a network's configured just by listening without transmitting a single packet. So another, um, another app that's uh, great to look at is Multigo. So Multigo takes one piece of information, you plot it on a map, and it allows you to pivot off that information to other pieces. Um, and it helps you build almost a mind map of either IP addresses or people or social information. Um, and Multigo is a, a, a semi-paid app. There's paid versions and free versions. Um, but there's open source solutions too, like Spiderfoot, uh, which basically does similar things. Um, you check the boxes of how many engines you want to query, you provide a domain name. And it's basically going to provide a ton of information in CSV format that you have to mine. Yeah. Things like uh, discovery scripts from uh, Lee Baird are fantastic, um, but they're just a starting place. While Lee Baird script is um, a great resource, you don't want to just run that script and say, okay, here's my recon section of this report. You want to take that information, gather the result, and then pivot off that to build, to build on it and improve it. And then, of course, Shodan is a great resource for uh, just looking at um, what's exposed externally in an environment. And these are different uh, screenshots of um, you know, these various tools. So, so this is Maltigo. So you get an idea of what that looks like. So you have you know, one device here, and you can see how it's, it has a relationship with something else. And taking screenshots of this once you have this and once you build this information is going to be helpful to explain this back to the client when you're conducting the test. So here's, um, this is a screenshot of Spiderfoot. And you can see it's very different. It's basically uh, going to run a number of checks and then it's basically going to dump all that data into CSV and then from there you need to do your own magic and either uh, <coughs> pull that into a database or uh, find a way to query that and pull that into a report. This is uh, Liebert's discovery script, which is uh, actually a, an amazing tool. Um, and he's gotten this to the point now where you can feed uh, just an IP range and it will go and end map and then feed the end map results back into Metasploit and try and run uh, known uh, Metasploit modules against um, what it's collected. But again, this is very much um, you know, a script and automation, so um, while this may find low-hanging fruit, you want to verify anything that uh, any sort of automation finds. And lastly, there's, a, there's actually a great book by Frank Ahern uh, called How to Disappear. And uh, so this is the title of the book would lead you to believe that it's supposed to be uh, something that you read to learn how to disappear. Uh, but really, if you look at all the advice in reverse, it's an excellent guide in how to track people and how to pivot on different pieces of information to figure out how someone works, where they're going to be, and what their routines are. Um, so this is one of the best resources I've found, believe it or not. So 
you get past those sort of passive recon <coughs> sections, and now you want to go into more, uh, I guess you'd say active recon. So here's some standard tools that you might do on an internal, or that you might use on an internal pen test. Uh, so this is Nmap, which is a port scanner, which basically is going to give you some some detail of uh, you know what's out there and what services are exposed and what versions of software, which, you know, that, that's the sort of information that you want uh, to be able to research back. So basically, you're executing these tools, you're pulling banners and trying to determine um, what systems are up, what's exposed, uh, what software versions are uh, available. And you want to take that and figure out, okay, given these things, how can I exploit these? Uh, but, and so given that, given that information, then you take that back and go into an exploit phase and try and exploit those. But uh, depending on the security, um, the security maturity of the organization, there's certain, there's certain uh, I would say, shortcuts that you can use for a, an organization that hasn't gone through a pen test before uh, that work extremely well. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, it, no one thinks they have them, but most organizations have open file shares with confidential information on them. It's just a, a, fact of, a fact of life. If you've conducted business for a while, um, it just happens. And so finding those shares, figuring out what's on them and what's usable. Uh, I know in my experience, I've found scripts with passwords. Uh, I've pulled domain admin creds off open file shares before. Um, finding devices that have default credentials, things like UPSs, cameras, um, <coughs> Uh, NAS devices uh, are incredibly common. And then a lot of organizations have devices that they swear that they can't patch. And so uh, identifying those devices quickly uh, can find you a quick and easy path to basically completely own a network. Trustwave Spider Labs uh, released a tool called Responder, which is fantastic. And what Responder does is it sits on a network and responds to any NetBIOS um, name broadcast with uh, a spoofed response. Um, and it'll do that for NetBIOS, it'll do that for uh, LLMNR, and it'll do that for uh, WPAD requests. So that means that you can get in the middle of a user and web traffic without using things like uh, ARP spoofing. It also means that this is a, a very quick and easy way to gather hashes. Um, so using a tool like Responder on a network that has never seen the tool before uh, is a very quick and easy way to uh, gather a ton of hashes um, and then once you take those hashes, crack them, um, you can pivot around the network fairly easily if they've never gone through the exercise before. Um, and if they have, the tool is great to verify that you know the controls they have in place are actually working. And lastly, I'd say uh, on uh, baseband management controllers for servers, there's a protocol called IPEN, which is, uh, uh, I think, Dell DRAC or uh, any sort of uh, out-of-band management, uh, have a, a protocol called IPMI. And IPMI works in such a way that, uh, at least version 2 does, where if you send the device a username, it'll respond back with the hash of the username's password. Um, and that's by design, which means that if you have that hash, then you can potentially crack that password. And so uh, Rapid7 did an excellent write-up, um, and I'll include this uh, in the slide. That's the, the researcher that initially discovered the vulnerability. So these are, these are shortcuts. Um, for an organization that has already gone through and tightened up a lot of this information, you know, and so for, uh, there's lots of ways to discover open file shares. Uh, the Metasploit module is probably the best, um, rather than using Nmap or any other tool, just because it'll gather that information quickly and dump it to a text file. So now you're in the exploit phase. You found all the devices. You want to exploit them. So I would say first and foremost, uh, before, I probably should have switched up the order, but Probably searching for specific attacks against certain applications is probably going to be, um, you know, your first and foremost. Um, attacking web apps, you need to know how to do that. Um, and there's lots of different uh, methods to attack. Um, 
OWASP is a great resource. Uh, a commonly overlooked method of exploitation is all layer two protocols. So things like uh, ARP and HSRP, um, these are all things that are typically unauthenticated that can be used to uh, get in between a device and uh, another device on a network uh, and manipulate that traffic or gather hashes. And if you have, uh, so I would strongly encourage you to, to test these tools ahead of time Test them on your, your home lab or in the work lab if you have it. And then, you know, fishing exercises. So uh, if you've never conducted a fishing exercise and don't know where to start, uh, Social Dash Engineer, Chris Agnaghi's site is an excellent resource to start. He's written a number of books about the subject. Uh, Dave Kennedy has the Social Engineering Toolkit. Uh, but there are a number of open source tools that will allow you to uh, craft a message, send it to users, have the users connect back to a landing page, and then if you combine these with other attacks, um, you can get a good foothold into a network uh, for a pen test, which is the, the goal is to basically demonstrate exploitation. <clears throat> and so if you're building a malware package, there's even tools that'll help with that. So things like fail evasion, um, and I listed Spray WMI, which isn't used specifically for, for building an attack package. It's used more on an internal test uh, for um, exploiting systems quickly. Uh, but well, it's probably the, the go-to tool right now. Um, one of the issues I've ran into is that um, what you think might be undetectable often is detectable. So testing these things ahead of time, um, they say don't, but everyone does. Um, running a sample through virus total um, is probably a good idea ahead of time to understand if you're, you know, if you spend all this time crafting a social engineering campaign only to have your sample flagged by whatever the spam solution is, then you kind of wasted your time. So you want to know that the sample is mostly undetectable uh, before you even really get started. And then once you exploit all the systems, so now you want to uh, exfiltrate the data, which uh, you know you're, you get so involved in uh, the recon and the exploiting that you get to this part and you're like, okay, now what? I got domain admin. Great. So um, doing things like granting yourself access to uh, mailboxes that you shouldn't have access to, finding confidential information, and finding it quickly. If this is a big organization, you need to have scripts. Uh, or you need to have a method to identify this information rather fast. And so these are just examples of, you know, uh, database dumps, uh, um, interpreter sessions, uh, showing that you've got access to the system. Uh, screenshots are awesome, uh, especially if you have a screenshot of someone's desktop with their apps open. But yeah, I think you guys get that, the idea. So you've gone through, you've exfiltrated all the data. Now what? So now you need to report on this information. <coughs> and so this is a, a, a pain of many pen testers. Um, but really your report needs to have three different parts. So you need to have an executive summary so someone can quickly understand what it is that you found and how important or critical it is. You need to have a detailed narrative with uh, finding information to show <coughs> what information you have, or what information you found, why it's important, why it's critical. This is where you should have things like your screenshots. Um, and then you need to have remediation guidance. So you need to have things like, um, you know, I found that it was possible to arc spoof and get in between this traffic. Um, so, you know, you need to implement controls against that. So you need to implement dynamic arc inspection or 802.1x or, you know, whatever your guidance is. And this can take extra time and extra research. So that's something that you want to uh, basically save for yourself to, to write or have time to, uh, to focus on to remediate. So, and the next few slides are just breakdowns of all these different parts. So, you know, the executive summary, what you did, who you did it to, what methods, and what conclusions. <coughs> the narrative, so that's basically the meteor test. Don't forget to include screenshots. And then for every finding you have, you need to include that how to fix it. 
And it doesn't mean that you're going to be the one responsible for fixing it, but you need to, you know, these are people who may not understand what it is you found or why it's important, let alone how to fix it. So you need to provide people or your client guidance on, on how to get started and uh, what direction to take. And that's it. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I bet. So, one of your earlier slides, you mentioned testing against Yeah. Can you talk about simulating Yes. <laughs> So, uh, when you're conducting a pen test, you're, you're testing production systems, um, but when you're developing your methods of attack, you don't want to figure it out on the fly. You basically, so uh, a great example is there's, a, there's an attack tool, tool called uh, Yersenia, and something that Yersenia does uh, will modify or spoof HSRP packets, which uh, are used for switch failover. So uh, if you don't understand what the tool does or what HSRP is, uh, you could cause a failover in the client's network and you could basically down their whole network uh, without ever realizing it. So that's, that's really what I mean by, you know, don't test in production, uh, don't develop your attacks uh, while you're uh, in the midst of a pen test. You want to do that in the lab if you can. Any other questions? I bet. You mentioned early on that one of the ways to get started in pen testing is to volunteer with a conference. Do you know any B-sides that are coming up soon? <laughs> I do. Oh. <laughs> so B-sides Connecticut is, um, uh, we're going to be starting in, uh, what, July 16th? Yep. Yeah, so B-sides Connecticut's July 16th. Um, there are lots of other B-sides. Um, B-sides Boston, these guys have um, they really have their things together. Now, he says Connecticut is not as big as this. Uh, we are jealous. Um, you guys really do a great job. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.